and request Dr. Shapiro to come here on that board. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Yana Shapiro for this thing. Good to offend the assistant uh, DG to start with in a conversation. And so uh, I'll start with Peter first. I think you uh, actually missed a few of the key points about your survey. Uh, one word that was missing was the word nutrition. And I don't know how anyone can talk about food if we don't talk about nutrition. The second thing that I'm surprised you didn't talk about was degraded land. Because pretty much all we have left is degraded land. I have no doubt that reduction of food waste is really one of the most critical pieces in the world. When you realize how many trillions gallons of water are wasted, it's 25% of all the agricultural water is wasted by food spoilage or things like aflatoxin. The other two things that I believe need to be on your list, one is resilience, whether we talk about climatic resilience or uh, salinity resilience, whatever those issues are. And the last one, which is something that we tend to avoid almost entirely, is big data. And big data is overwhelming us. And yesterday at breakfast, I had a conversation about you do 100 genomes, you resequence them 100 times, that's 10,000 sequences. What do you do with all this stuff? And so what I'd like to propose today is a, a way of looking at food and nutritional security in developing countries. And I didn't come to this because I've spent my life working in the third world. I, I work for a Fortune 500 company called Mars Incorporated, the third largest food company in the world with sales of over $40 billion with 77,000 employees. I'm also based at the University of California, Davis, and at ICRAF in Nairobi. So I, I have a, a kind of interesting view of this whole thing. But the thing that I, I would like to point out to you is that it, it normally doesn't come from the environment that we work in that you get activated to do something. And in this particular case, it was a lecture by an assistant professor named Christine Stewart from the Department of Nutrition at the University of California, Davis, who gave a lecture that only lasted five minutes. And you know, you can say that you had an epiphany or something wonderful happened, but it really did change my life because uh, after her lecture talking about stunting in Africa, I decided that I had to do something about it. And this is a story about using genomics to, to try and change the fundamental food system in the rural sector of Africa. And those of you who are sitting out there can say, well, that's preposterous, you can't possibly do that that there's no way that one can make an intervention at that scale. But actually, I think you can. And in Christina's uh, presentation, she put this poem up early in the presentation. And one of the things that we always talk about, well, we'll get that next week, we'll do that next week, we'll order the piece of equipment next week, we'll do the annotation next week, we'll do the analysis next week, we'll go to the field next week. But children can't wait. Uh, a child can't wait. A child can't be malnourished and chronically hungry and expect for him or her to end up in this room as a breeder in an institution around the world. They won't be the Tata family. They won't be Einstein. They won't be Usain Bolt. They won't be any of these people because they didn't have the appropriate nutrition in their life. And some fairly startling statistics. 37% of the rural sector in Africa is stunted. 70% of the children in the United States are stunted. And we certainly have plenty of food in quotations, but we don't necessarily have nutritious food. And the number that I found recently was 48% of the rural population of children in India is stunted. And part of that is nutrition, no question, uh, is nutrition, and part of it's sanitation as well. But when you see the hot map, of the areas where chronic hunger and malnutrition cause stunting in children, it's alarming. We talk about the rising of Africa, that it has the future for agriculture, for industry, for all of these sorts of things. And at the end of the day, what you have to say is, not this way. It won't happen this way. And if we want to have a society that is actually divided between those who have it and those that don't, this is a pretty good way to do it. 
So what is the source of all life? For me, it's making food crops more nutritious. You have to have water, I understand that. You have to have housing, I understand that. But the real issue is nutrition, isn't it? I was at the State Department not long ago and two of the gentlemen in the audience was the COO of Monsanto and the CEO of Pioneer Hybrid. And since I was giving the speech, I could ask them questions. So I asked them if they would share their databases on nutrition in crops. Not what they did, not the exact methodology they utilized to do the work, but how they thought about it so we could jumpstart what we were doing in Africa. And at the break, they both came up to me rather sheepishly and said, I'm not sure we really have anything. We're just trying to hold where we are with nutrition. So that's not really an endorsement. Productivity will take you a long way, but productivity with hollow calories, low nutrition, lack of minerals, vitamins, what have you, will not get you there. So being a plant breeder, and I, and I am, this is how I live my life, anybody know what this seed is? One six hundredth of a gram? Who said that? There you have it. It's a sequoia tree. So one six hundredth of a gram will grow at two months a little seedling about this tall. That's two months, right? At the end of 2,000 years, it looks like that. And that's General Sherman. That's the name of the tree. And it weighs as much as six 747 jetliners, fully loaded. And nobody, but nobody, talking about physiology, can really tell you how the water gets to the top of the tree, how the nutrients move up and down this tree. And this was, at one point, the biggest uh, redwood, not sequoia, uh, the biggest redwood in the world. And it was at 394 feet tall, as long as, I believe, what you call a football pitch. So when I look at this, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of put in mind that what we have to do is we have to double the annual food. But it's not just calories, it's nutrition. We have to double the nutritional output. And when I think about it, and I think about the human body, and I think what a vascular system is, and I think about the physiology, we could fit all the serious plant physiology people in the world in this room. I mean, we have one or two at UC Davis, one of the premier ag schools in the world. That's it for an entire university. It seems like we've forgotten plant physiology. And so what I'm after is nutritional optimization. How can we breed for nutritional optimization? And everybody knows what this is. And everybody knows what is, let's see if I can get this to work, the endosperm where everything is carried. And look how much headway we have made from the evolution of teosinte to the teosinte corn hybrid to modern corn. It, it's astonishing we've made that much progress. And to have people tell you that they aren't working on the nutrition, they're working on yield, they're working on water use efficiency, nutrient use efficiency, but not to work on nutrition seems like we have taken the wrong path at this point. And I would point out to you that a seed and an ovum are actually quite interesting and actually quite a bit the same. So as you see this little small video, they're actually very similar. They have anchored roots. They have impl uh, implantation. They have nutrient retrieval. They have nutrient retrieval. So a human being is actually quite a bit like a plant in many, many ways. They grow. And at this stage in fetal growth, everyone knows what happens without the right nutrition. So when you think about that, and we think about what a plant is and what a human is, what is it that we really need? So this is normal vision with the right amount of vitamin A. So this is normal vision at night. And this is what it looks like if you have nighttime 
blindness caused by vitamin A deficiency. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to comprehend that that's how you would see at night if you had vitamin A deficiency. And yet, and still, that's 37% of the population of Africa. If you look at red blood cells, and anemia is a major issue here in India. That's a normal red blood cell, that's vitality. And this is fatigue or anemic red blood cells. The difference is startling. And we see this, and we know there's an issue, but how many of you are breeding for iron content to eradicate anemia in plants? Can you raise your hands? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, that's not bad. There should be about 600 of us raising our hands to say that, because that's the scale of the problem. And if you look at iodine and what it causes cretinism, the lack of iodine is something that is really not that complex, and it should be able to be overcome. If you look at green vegetables, and India has a wealth of green vegetables, Africa has a wealth of green vegetables. When you look at folate, in, which is critical for neural tube development, there is simply no way that we shouldn't be breeding for folates. How many people are breeding for folates in the room? None. And of course, everyone knows the value of nuts and what they can do for you, specifically in the area of zinc and stunted growth. The medical world has made this a, a key point of, of science on zinc supplementation. How many are breeding for zinc? You've already raised your hand. You're really busy. <laughs> yeah, not many. So when we think about it, we're not really putting the effort into these sorts of things. And yesterday at breakfast, we were having a conversation about what has happened. How many of you remember 96 well plates? Can you raise your hands? 96 well plates. This really is a young group. Do you have any idea what the new life technology chip, how many wells it has? And if you're from life technology, you can't comment. 1.2 billion wells. So imagine the amount of information that may or may not be utilized in a really rational manner. So this is my favorite crop. I always like maize just because what it did. This gives you an idea of what we see. The phenotype, you look at a kernel, 7 times 10 to the minus third. This is giving you an idea of how we're seeing differently today. Endosperm, single cell, condensed chromosomes, Scaffolds, 3 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. You know what a histone is, of course. 1 times 10 to the minus 8. And we get down to DNA, 2 times 10 to the minus 9th. That's how far we can see. And yet and still, we only have a few folate breeders, a few zinc breeders, almost no iron breeders. We can see all this, and yet what do we do with it? So the answer for me was to form this thing called the African Orphan Crops Consortium. And it's a very, very loose consortium. We have no director. We have no administration. We have no office. Uh, we, we don't have, I mean, I have to, every time I say it, it makes me laugh on a certain level. We don't have any of those things. We meet by consensus twice a year with a group of uncommon collaborators. So our goal was to sequence 100 plants, which are the backbone of Africa in the rural sector, spider plant, things like that. that are very much like spinach, what have you. And in 2010, we began that because I did the cacao genome. And then Christine Stewart inspired me. And when we were approved for this project by the African Union President's Council, they asked us to also sequence baobab. So for what started at a conversation in a very modest way, when I went to BGI to meet the co-directors and asked them to help, they said 16 or 18 plants wasn't enough to make an impact. You need to do 96. I don't know where the number came from, but now we're doing 101. And if I look at your list of um, people who have supported this extraordinary uh, conference, we have um, two CG centers, uh, BECA, which is at ILRI and the World Agroforestry Center. We have NEPAD, which is the development arm of the African Union. We have BGI Life Technologies, Google, 
which is moving all the data for us around the world, the World Wildlife Fund, which helped us do our survey, LGC, which is on your list, uh, N2N, and then iPlant Collaborative. One of the important things is we sent out 100 surveys and got back 106, which is pretty extraordinary for a survey. And this was one of the most difficult surveys anyone could ever have created because it asked for a range of information that was so vast that we thought we'd get back a dozen and we'd be happy. We actually got back six more than we sent out. And the icon of Baobab was the 101st. Um, Baobab has four times the potassium as bananas, 10 times the antioxidant of oranges, and two times the calcium of spinach. And people eat these leaves. They're actually quite tasty. I had them prepared. So we started at BGI doing the reference genomes, which we're doing now. Uh, they're a great partner. Uh, those of you who know BGI uh, know the experience. My favorite part of my BGI experience besides the extraordinary science, there's a wall from me to that far corner of covers of nature science, cell, nature biotechnology that the work is generated. And so they're a very interesting and problem-solving group. And then we knew we had to train African scientists. And it's not that African scientists aren't being trained today. There's plenty of programs funded through Gates and Rockefeller in the past and USAID and other groups that are working there. But we had a particular notion of taking people who are plant breeders in national agricultural research institutions and in colleges and universities across Africa and bringing them in and training them at no cost to them over a year for six weeks. And I'll get to that in a minute. And then, of course, the scientists and the crop breeders work together, and at the end it's the African citizen who is the beneficiary of the entire activity. All of the data for all 101 genomes and 10,100 uh, resequences are all in the public domain, so nothing can be owned. And this is sort of the face of um, what poverty looks like, you know, and we always have this image of a begging bowl, but it's not so much a question of more food, it's more a question of better food. And that's what one has to think about. It's not more food. You can eat calorically high quantities of food and still be stunted. So some of the agencies which are working on food and food security have to change the way they think and come to a position where it's not specifically calories, it's the question of better food. So here's an idea of countries of high burden. None of them are a surprise to you, 40% in many of these cases. Here's West Africa, or here's East Africa, here's West Africa, here's Central Africa. So Africa suffers immensely from this problem. And this is what our process is like. BGI does everything through the annotation of the reference genomes. The academy then resequences hundreds of varieties of the plant. The breeding program uses this information to produce superior crop values. Now, what you have to realize is none of this is perfect. How you use this information is really critical. What does an integrated breeding program actually look like? How do you take the data and make it work? And what I have to say is we're not perfect. And we're not sure we have all the answers. And anyone in this room who has an answer to any of these questions, we would welcome it. Because as you can see, our consortium is not based on a closed door. And this is how they were chosen, nutritional value, use, not currently sequenced, though we are resequencing some crops that were partially done. And then the normal sorts of things, climatic uh, adaptability and drought tolerance. So Ibrahim Ayaki is the CEO of NEPAD, Malnutrition can have a devastating effect on population, including high mortality and morbidity. We can't, we can't sit by and watch this happen. Tony Simons, who's the DG at ICRAF, the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi, the most malnourished, the poorest, the most rural, and, and the least forested, that's the area where we're working. Here's an image of some of the orders we're working on. Uh, I think you can see it's quite vast. 28 orders, 45 family, 101 species. 
And when you get down to the families, of course, Fabiaceae has a huge impact on what can happen. Uh, and you can certainly understand that. But one of the crops is finger mill, one of the crops is pigeon pea, spider plant. Some of these you're familiar with, some of them you're not. But here gives an idea about spider plant, which is a brassica, its nutritional uh, composition. The protein values are extraordinary. It's eaten all the time. We just need to boost it in certain characteristics. And of the crops, 14 are trees outside of baobab. And most of them are fruiting trees. It gives you an idea here, the lack of fruit consumption, grams per day, of the World Health Organization, the European Union versus Africa, which is terribly, terribly lagging behind minimum standards. And some of these have fantastic nutrition. Um, the Adansonia. If you look at that, the vitamin C levels versus a mango and orange, it outstrips those incredibly. So we have to really work on getting these particular types of crops to the place we need them to be. On December 10th, 2013, 21 participants from 11 countries, four women, 11 PhDs, 10 MSs, working on 59 crops began their first class. Second class begins in May of 2015. The keystone piece behind all of this is these people came their institutions found value. 59 of the 101 crops were being worked on. This gives us a key to open the door even farther than it was open before. So if one can take that opportunity, if one can actually change those food crops, and these are Pan-Africa, they're not East Africa, West Africa, South Africa. The only area where we're slight on plants is the desert states or the desert countries. So this is what is expected. De-orphanize ownership. And one of the students interviewed by CCTV at the graduation ceremony, he said, Coco Yam used to be an orphan. It's not an orphan anymore, it has a father. So people are adopting these crops. And additionally, on top of all the costs for the classes, transportation, food and lodging. Grants are given to all of these students to go back to their institutions and start working. And this is our network beyond what is going on currently with the original founders. And you can see uh, many of you know these groups intimately. Uh, we just received from Illumina their Right Livelihood Award for $100,000 in reagents to um, in Africa do transcriptomes for 50 plants. And this is one of the things that made me happiest as I've been as a 70-year-old individual for a long time. This was the first graduating class at graduation. We had about 45 applications for the first class. We have 290 for the second class. We didn't have enough women in the first class because women typically in Africa are not pushed to the front to attend institutions like this. We have about a third of the applicants now are women because the word has gotten out that this is a class that they could take. Now, is this the only solution to solving chronic hunger and malnutrition in Africa or in South America or India or the United States? I don't think so. It's just one that had the ability to be pulled together without having bureaucracy attached to it at a very high level where all the participants are given an equal voice. So we meet twice a year to plan for the year, early in the year or late in the year and then mid-year, where we go over everything that's going on. Uh, we've raised probably $30 million in kind so far. We're still short probably seven to $10 million to pay for all the reagents and things of that nature and the run. This will be in place between in six years, and then it will become a totally public institution available to everyone. Now, if you're a scientist and you have something you want to sequence, you can send the material, they'll extract it for you, they'll run it in the order where it's received, but it's all free services. Life Technology was very gracious with us. They gave us the sequencing equipment we're using ion protons. I happen to like Sanger the best, 
Some people like PacBio, some people like Illumina, some people still like Selexa. It doesn't matter. It's information that can be utilized if it's adapted appropriately through a breeding program. My final point, I think, is that all the technology in the world doesn't help. And I love discovery. Discovery is when it makes me happy. But it's translation that actually makes me much happier. And it's scaling that information to impact a public, which really makes me happy. And while we sit in our laboratories all around the world and look in our microscope and run our sequences, and say we found something on chromosome 6 that looks like it's the real thing, till that's translated and someone's eating that crop, then it doesn't really happen. I salute the organizers for this meeting. I think it's great. I'm thrilled to see so many women in the audience and people of color besides myself. Usually at these meetings it's old white guys in large part. And so this really represents a, a change. You should think of yourselves uh, as an army of science that's going out to change the world. There are no generals in your army. Everyone is a general, and everyone in this room has the opportunity to do what we're talking about at any scale. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to uh, extend to all those speakers that come after me a welcome as well. Uh, this is one of those opportunities that doesn't come along very often, and we should uh, applaud I Icrasat for its wisdom in holding this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Howard. So this presentation was really very impressive and simply superb. And he outlined very nicely, and I'm not going to repeat these things because this was wonderful. I don't have any words, but again, thanks a lot, Howard, for